So you said there were more in the library, have you? Or? <laughs> no, I will not need it. Um, I'd be probably just like spread it out if we could have like um, one for every three people or something like that. Mm. I mean, tea mugs, but I do um, we're gonna use them a little bit later. So yeah, you can just pass up one for every three people. Like, so do the groups, yeah. and if the sisters need it, you just go. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala ali wa sahbihi. Ajman. Okay, so, um, can you guys hear on the... On the platform, yeah. Boys IQ, you guys here? Yeah. One time, slow down. Play. So, inshallah, today we're going to look at Babu Shahadat, I'm sorry, Babu Tafsir at Tawheed, wa Shahadati Halla ilaha illallah. So, we're going to look at the chapter, the explanation or the interpretation of a tawheed and the testimony la ilaha illallah and what we're going to need uh, ultimately once we get past the introduction is we're going to need maybe to do like uh, everybody have a mushaf quran and we could do it maybe one for each group of three because we're going to look at the ayat together and practically look for something. So it'll be a practical exercise. We'll practically look for something, okay? Yeah. So, so if, have, yeah, well, I have these here. You can have these too. And you don't need, we don't need one for each person, but rather what we could do is we could do it in groups of two or three. Uh, and that way you can kind of help each other out as we go through it. <clears throat> so, um, Sheikh al-Imam, in this chapter, he wants to achieve three things. The first thing, obviously, from the chapter, or the title of the chapter, he wants to clarify the correct understanding, the correct interpretation of a tawheed and the shahada, la ilaha illallah. So, what's the proper meaning of it? That's what he wants to do. He wants to clarify how it should be understood. And what is the foundation of that understanding? What is that based on? This interpretation that we're going to give, or that he's going to give, or we're going to glean from the ayat that he's going to bring, and the hadith that he mentions, what's the foundation of it all? What does it all go back to, this tawheed? So that's the first thing. The second thing is he wants to point out the sources that we refer to for this understanding. So we're going to understand what is the foundation of the Tawheed, how should it be interpreted, how should it be understood, and what are the sources that we go back to for this interpretation. Then by that, how these sources should be looked at, how they've, they're studied so that we do what? So that we extract correctly, we, we come to the right conclusion. You guys got it? So these are the three things that the Sheikh is going to do in this chapter, or he seeks to do in this chapter. And before we can really, really understand what the Shaykh is getting at from the ayat and the hadith that he quotes, 
we need to understand something else. And that is, what was the stance of the pagans of Mecca toward the three categories of a Tawheed? What was the stance of the pagans of Mecca to whom the Qur'an was first revealed and the Prophet was first sent? What was their stance toward the three categories of a Tawheed? Because whatever we study after this, we have to put it in, pers in the perspective and we have to understand it through the context of that. And that's how we can understand what the Shaykh is trying to do in this chapter. So now, what were the three categories of Tawheed that we mentioned in the beginning of the, of the course? What were the three categories of a Tawheed? Anybody? English, Arabic, Urdu, I'll take anything. I just, what were they? Tawheed al rububiyyah and we said Tawheed al rububiyyah is Tawheed Allahi fi af'ali, or Ifrad Allahi fi af'ali. So it's basically you single out Allah, you single, that's what I'm going to say. Al uluhiyah mumtaz. So al rububiyyah we single out Allah as it relates to his what? His actions, the actions which are specific to him. Tawheed al uluhiyah we single out Allah as it relates to as it relates to the actions, what? That we do that are specific to him. So the first one, al-Rububiyyah, the actions that he does which are specific to him. Al-Uluhiyyah, or al-Ibadah, the actions that we do which are specific to him, the acts of worship that we do. Right, and the last, Ahsant, Tawheed al-Asma'i, was-Sifat, which is singing out Allah with respect to what? The names and attributes which are specific to him. So we have these three categories of Tawheed. So now we have to understand, before we can get to those three points that the Sheikh wants to hit on, we have to understand what was the stance of the pagans of Mecca toward these three categories of Tawheed. Leish, why is that? Because if you want to understand what la ilaha illa mean, la ilaha illallah, what it really means, you have to look at the fact that the, the pagans, did they accept it or reject it? They rejected it. Not only did they reject it, they fought and persecuted the people who embraced it. And they considered it an affront to everything they believed in. This undermines everything we believe in. So if that's the case, whatever la ilaha illallah means, it can't be something that they themselves believe in. Is that right? You guys agree with that? Whatever the correct interpretation of la ilaha illallah, whatever it is, it can't be something that they, that they believe in, right? right? Because if it's something that they believe in, they wouldn't right. reject it and persecute the people who embrace it and consider an affront to everything, undermining everything that they believe in. Does that make sense? So that's, why, that's, that's, that was, that's what lays the foundation for us. That what was their stance toward these three categories of Tawheed? And the reason why I say this is because if you look at the interpretation of la ilaha illallah, You'll see that you have interpretations which are which relate to one of the categories of a tawheed. So, for example, you have somebody say the meaning of la ilaha illallah is la khaliq illallah. There's no creator except Allah. La mudabbir illallah. There's no one who controls and manages the affairs except Allah. You see that? Now, when you say there's no one who controls, there's no one who creates. What Tawheed does that go back to? What Tawheed is that related to? al Because that's his actions, right? Creating and controlling, that's his actions. We said Tawheed al is what? What is specific, the Tawheed of his actions. The actions are specific to him. Perfect. So somebody will say, the meaning of la ilaha illallah is la khaliq illallah. We say, okay, is that the right interpretation? So we go back to where? We go back to the pagans of Mecca. And we say, well, what was their stance toward Tawheed? Did they reject it or accept it? They what? They accepted it. They didn't have any issues with Tawheed or Rububiyyah. To the point that Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا إِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ لَيَقُولُنَّ Allah. If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they would say, Allah. They had no issues with that whatsoever. وَمَنْ يُدَبِّرْ الْأَمْرَ فَسِيَقُولُنَّ Allah. And ask them who controls the affairs, who disposes everything in the universe? They will say, Allah. They had no issues whatsoever with Tawheed or Rububi, except one aspect of it, 
which is what? And ba'ath wa nushur. Resurrection. Life after death. They didn't believe in that. But other than that, they accepted to eat Rubiyah. Allah is al khaliq al-raziq, al-mudabbir. They believed in all of that. So they have any issues with what? Tawheed or Rubiyah. So that means that the interpretation of La ilaha illallah cannot go back to what? Tawheed or Rubiyah. Because if it were related to Tawheed or Rubiyah, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have rejected it. And they wouldn't have opposed and persecuted the people who accepted it. Does that make sense so far, Yahuwah? You, you guys with me? Does anybody question that or want to ask a question about that? Make sense so far? Like Mumtaz. Another person will come, or another group of people, they'll come and say, okay, the meaning of la ilaha Allah is that there is no one who is the all-seeing, the all-hearing, the almighty, the all-knowing, except Allah. They'll say there's no one who's the all-seeing, the all-hearing, the all-knowing, the almighty, except Allah. So now that interpretation goes back to which category of tawheed? Ah, al-asma'i wa sifat al-asma'i wa sifat the names and attributes the qualities of Allah so we want to check this now we have a gauge our gauge is what? kufar Quraysh so what was the position of kufar Quraysh towards the asma of Allah and his sifat what was their stance? what was their position? were they for it or against it? against the asma wa sifat طيب, let's start first of all with a sifat Ibn Taymiyyah, he said in Al-Hamawiyyah that the pagans, they accepted the names and attributes of Allah without exception, absolutely. They never opposed the, I'm sorry, they never opposed, let me pay attention, let me, let me, let me say that again, they never opposed the attributes, a sifat of Allah. So for example, Allah would say in the Quran, um, وَقَالُوا يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَ غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَلُعِنُوا بَلْ يَدَاهُمْ مَبْسُوطَتَانِ يُنْفِقُوا كَيْفَ كَيْفَ يَشَاءَ So Allah would say in the Qur'an, they say, talking about Al-Yahud, that the hands of Allah are tied up. غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ May their hands be tied up. وَلُعِنُوا May they be cursed. بَلْ يَدَاهُمْ مَبْسُوطَتَانِ Rather, his hands are what? Are outstretched. So notice Allah attributes to himself what? Hands. And the pagans would do what? Would accept it. They wouldn't reject it. They wouldn't say, Allah doesn't have hands. They never did that. Whatever the sifa was, whatever the quality was, they what? They accepted it. Ibn Taymiyyah said without exception, they accepted what? A sifat. This is fi shay fil hamawiyya. But now we come to what? Al-Asma. Al-Asma, Ibn Kathir, and Suleiman ibn Abdullah, they said that the pagans accepted all of the asma except Rahman. Ar-Rahman. The only name that they opposed or rejected was Ar-Rahman. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ Rahman. They disbelieve, they reject, they deny Ar-Rahman. And he says in the ayah, uh, ayah of Surah Al-Furqan, he says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اشْجُدُ لِلْرَّحْمَانِ قَالُوا هُمَ الرَّحْمَانِ And if it was said to them, prostrate to Ar-Rahman, they say, and who is Ar-Rahman? And the hadith, uh, the hadith of Al-Masur ibn Makhzama, which is in Al-Bukhari, and it's the hadith of Sulh al-Hudaybiyah, the hadith where he narrates this, the qissa of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, in that hadith, he mentions that the person who was sent to write the treaty or to, to uh, negotiate the treaty from the Quraysh, his name was Suhail ibn, anybody remember his last name? Or his father's name? Suhail ibn Amr. So Suhail ibn Amr, he comes. And when he comes, they agree, I guess, okay, we're going to write a treaty. We're going to try to settle this peacefully. So, he tells, you know, the, he tells Muhammad, he tells him, okay, go ahead and write. So, the Prophet begins, so I set up to dictate the treaty. So, what does he begin? Everything that he writes, he begins with what? Al-Basmala. 
So he tells a scribe, who was Ali ibn Abi Talib, he tells him, write Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. So when he says that, Suhail ibn Amr, he says, Amma Rahman, fama adri ma huwa. He said, as for ar-Rahman, I don't know what that is. So write the way you used to write, and your fathers have written. Bismik Allah, Bismik Allahumma. Right? So you see that the only name that they opposed was what? Ar-Rahman. And you notice in the Quran, Allah does what? He refutes them for denying Ar-Rahman. Ibn Kathir, he said, if they had opposed another name, Allah would have what? Would have refuted them for opposing it. But the only name he refuted them for opposing was Ar-Rahman. So they had no problem with what? As-Sifat, mutlaqan, absolutely. And no problem with Al-Asma except what? Ar-Rahman. So do you think that the tafsir of a tawheed, the explanation of tawheed, should go back to asma wa sifat? No, because they didn't have a problem with it, they didn't have an issue with it, they didn't reject it. So what's left? Hmm? Well, we finish with al asma, we finish with sifat, we finish with what? al rububiya al uluhiya al ibadah. So that's where they had the issue. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah, uh, surah Al-Sad, I'm sorry, Surah Al-Sad, verse number 5, He says that they say, have they made, or has he made, Muhammad Sallallahu has he made all of the gods one god? This is indeed a curious thing, a strange thing, something that we're not what? We're not accustomed to, we're not familiar with. This is something odd, right? So they believe that there were many deities, many objects that could be worshipped and not just one deity. So that tells you that their issue with the Shahada came with what? The meaning of the Shahada being La Ma'buda Haqqun illallah. There is no one worthy of worship, really, genuinely worthy of worship except Allah. So that's where their issue came. Their issue came with what? Tawheed and Ibadah. So the foundation that we lay is that. The real meaning of la ilaha illallah has to go is related to what? Tawheed. Tawheed. Okay, let's let's do it like this. A Tawheed Rububiya. B Tawheed al Asma'i wa Sifat. C Tawheed al Ibadah and D none of the above. C. Let me see hands for C. Huh? Is that all of the above? No, no, D is none of the above. We can make E all of the above. <laughs> and you go, what? F, he said. So we're all agreed, it's C, Tawheed al Because that was the only one that they what? They rejected, they opposed. Tawheed al Ibadah. So, either So you're saying that the definition of the Allah. Is only Tawheed al-Rububiyah? No, Tawheed al ibadah That's the asl of it. Does it mean that it doesn't encompass indirectly, but directly the tafsir of a Tawheed La ilaha illallah is la ma'buda bihaqqin illallah No one is rightfully worshipped except Allah because that's that's what the pagans opposed and if it had something to do, if it related to they wouldn't have opposed it because they believed in that. If it was related to al-asma, they wouldn't have opposed it. They believed in it. If it was a sifat, they wouldn't have opposed it. They believed in those. But their problem was what? Their issue was what? One deity. One object of worship. That was where their problem came. So that's the foundation of it. Okay? Does that make sense or no? It doesn't make sense. Okay. Because uh, you got Jews, you got Christians, uh -huh. other people that... Don't believe actually in, in Ismail Sifat and, 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 and even some of the weird out of the um, you know groups that came after the yeah. Prophet. Some of them believed in everything but one of the Rububiyyah or one of the Asma or one of the Sifat. Do you mean? And they're not Muslim. No, we didn't say that you would be Muslim. But it's we, that's, not, not the issue. That's, not, that's not the issue. What we're saying is that the tafsir of La ilaha illallah. What does it mean? Some people say it means La khaliq illallah. 
There's no creator except Allah. And we say, well, then that would go back to what? Tawheed al-Rububiyya. That would mean that Allah is telling us, or, or that the, the meaning of a shahada is related to Tawheed al-Rububiyya. And we say, if that's the meaning, then why would the pagans reject it? Why would they persecute the people who embraced it? Why would they consider it an affront to what they believed in when they themselves believed in, in, in what? In Allah being the only Lord. Okay, so we say that's, that doesn't make sense because they wouldn't oppose it. So basically what we use is, we use the pagans of Mecca as a gauge to determine what? What the correct tafsir of a tawheed is. Now the fact that we make a tafsir of a tawheed doesn't mean that the Jews become Muslims or the, or the you know, other groups become Muslim. No, we're just saying, what is the correct way that la ilaha illallah should be interpreted? What's a good gauge for that? The pagans of Mecca. Because if it had something to do with Rubiya, and they believed in Rubiya, they would accept la ilaha illallah, but they didn't. If it was Asma, they would accept it, because they accepted all the Asma except for Rahman, but they didn't. As-Sifat, same thing. So what's left? Al-Ibadah. And if we know, if we look, we see that what? That was the concept that they couldn't accept, they couldn't fathom. That there's only one deity worthy of worship. When the Prophet Islam came, how many idols were there around the Kaaba? I mean, 360 some odd. Right? Some say 65, some say 60. But 360 some odd idols, around, just around the Kaaba. And a lot of them had their own individual idols that they worshipped. And they considered all of these idols to be what? Intermediaries between them and Allah. So for them, that was a bad That was, you know, how it's supposed to be done. These deities are our wasa'it. They are intermediaries between us and Allah. And this is how it has to be and so on and so forth. So when the Prophet ﷺ came, what did he come with primarily? Did he come with Tawheed al-Rububiyya? Absolutely, absolutely came with it. But did he come with that primarily? No, because when he came to the people, he came to a people who believed in that. And that wasn't enough. That's another thing, too, which is important that we learn um, consequently, is that it's not enough to just believe in Tawheed or Rububiyya. It's not enough to believe in Tawheed al-Asma or Tawheed al-Sifat without what? Tawheed al-Ibadah. Or Tawheed al-Ibadah is what? The crux of it, the cornerstone. Does that make sense? Or not yet? No, I think it does. Hey. One of the Mashaykh, I asked him, what's mm-hmm. the meaning of Allah? And he yeah. said, uh, uh, that means that, La ma'buda illallah. That's it, yeah. He said, but it's that, that's not enough. He said, mm-hmm. La ma'buda illallah, wa la yu'abadu ilaha illa bima sharra, wa la yusafu illa bima wasafi bihi nafsa. Jameel. He, he, he gave a, you know, an explanation that was like, yeah. but it took about 10 seconds. And, that's no, you know, and there's no contradiction between that and, and what I'm saying, because if you had tawheed al-ibadah, and you didn't have the other categories of Tawheed, it wouldn't be complete. But what I'm saying is that, which, if you look at the categories, which one of them is the foundation, the most important one, the most critical one? Tawheed and Ibadah. You follow what I'm saying? That's the point. Yeah. So basically, if we have that gauge, now we can circle back. Once we've set that and we understand that, we can circle back. We can circle back and look at the three points. So, the first point is the Shaykh, he wanted to clarify. He wanted to clarify this meaning, because it's critical for us to understand this meaning, because many Muslims, unfortunately, they don't understand the meaning. If you ask them, they would say things like that. There's no Lord except Allah. There's no Creator except Allah. And that's going back to what? Arububiyya. They'll say there's no one who, who is the all-hearing except Allah. No one who's the all-seeing except Allah. Wa alaykum salam wa Yunus. So again, he wanted to clarify, especially in his, his time, there was a lot of confusion about what la ilaha Allah meant. And you had lots of people who do what? They would go, at his time, they would go to tombs, and they would worship at these tombs, and they thought it was okay. Because we believe that what? The real Khalif is Allah. The real Almighty is Allah. So they thought the fact that they believed those things, what? That was a Tawheed. And the fact that they worshipped dead people in their tombs didn't violate a Tawheed like that. So the same point, it's, it's still prevalent today, it's still a problem today. And so that's why this chapter comes to clarify. That you have to understand that the crux of it, the cornerstone of it is what? Tawheed and Ibadah. The Thubadalik, the sources. The sources for this Tawheed. 
or the sources for this interpretation, I should, I should say, of a Tawheed, he gives us, if we look at uh, the chapter, he gives us four ayat and one hadith, which he uses to what? To make the tafsir. So what is the shaykh telling us in a roundabout way? That if you want to understand the meaning of a Tawheed, you want to understand the meaning of La ilaha Allah, you have to go back to what? The Qur'an hadith. The Qur'an hadith is what? Filled with what? The explanation of a Tawheed and La ilaha illallah. Then ba'dalik, there's, if we look at the text that he gives us, there's one thing they all have in common. And that's what he's telling us as far as what do we look for when we read the sources, what do we look for to determine the tafsir of Tawheed? You look for the common thread between these evidences I'm going to give you, the examples I'm going to give you. And the common thread is a nafi, negation, wal ithbat, affirmation or confirmation. So a nafi means what? Negating something. And confirmation means what? Affirming it. Okay, affirming something. So let's look at the statement, la ilaha illallah, which contains what? A nafi wal ithbat, which is the foundation of a tawheed. You have to negate, and then you have to what? Affirm. So let's look at the first part. La ilaha. There is no deity worthy of worship. That's negation or affirmation? Negation. negation. So the first thing we do in a tawheed is we negate what? We negate what is specific to Allah from what? From everything. Illallah, that would be then what? Affir- affirmation. And so after we negate... Everything which is specific to Allah from other than Allah, we do what? We confirm it for who? For Allah. So now the examples he's going to give us, and the examples that we're supposed to look for in the Quran and Hadith, which teach us what the meaning of Tawheed is, the one thing they all have in common is this Anafi wal Ithbat. Anafi wal Ithbat. And so what the reason why I gave you the Musahif is because what I want you to do is I'm going to tell you the ayah, the surah and the ayah. I want you to look it up. And then I want you to tell me where the nafi is and where the ithbat is. Does that sound fair? Does that sound fair? And you guys can work together if you work in groups. So let's look at the first one. Let's look at the first one. The first ayah. The first ayah is Surah Al-Isra. Surah Al-Isra, which is the 17th surah. Verses 56 and 57. 56 and 57. Okay? So now you have Surah Al-Isra, verses 56 and 57. Find it, look at it with your partner, and then I'll have somebody read it, and then we'll see if we can determine where the nefi is and where the ifbat is. Surah, Isra, Surah Al-Isra, seventeenth Surah, verses 56 and 57. All right? And you're going to need both ayat. And don't be, don't be fooled. Don't be surprised. What may happen is that the nephi may be in one eye. The effect may be in another eye. Also, they might be what? They might be turned upside down, too. It's in the sense that you'll get the ifbat first and then the nephi. So don't study it and then uh, you let me know what you think. Where's the nephi and where's the, where's the ifbat? All right. So has everybody located it? Has everybody located it? Okay, Mumtaz. All right, read it over with your partner. And then if somebody's ready for an answer, just raise your hand. We'll see. 56 and 57. Yeah, the verse of 56 and 57 and the surah is uh, 17. Let me see. All right. So are we ready? Anybody ready? Not yet. Not yet. Huh? Nephi negation. Okay. It's bad. 
affirmation or confirmation. All right. All right. And also, we might typically look for negating words. Right? Right. No, don't, stop. It might not be like that. You might have to look at it from the point of view of the meaning. That it negates by meaning. Not by what? By the actual word. A negating word. Okay? So let's look at it. It says, or let's, let's read it. It says, أُرِدُوا الَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُ مِنْ دُنِهِ فَلَا يَمْلِكُونَ كَشْفَ الضُّرِّ عَنْكُمْ وَلَا تَحْوِيلًا أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ يَبْتَغُونَ لَرَبِّهِمْ الْغُسِيلًا أَيُّهُمْ أَقْرَبُ وَيَرْجُونَ رَحْمَتُهُ وَيَخَافُونَ أَذَابًا إِنَّ أَذَابَ رَبِّكَ كَانَ مَحْذُورًا So call upon those besides him I'm saying say, oh Muhammad Call upon those besides him who you pretend to be gods They have neither the power to remove the adversity from you nor even to shift it from you to another person those whom they call upon like desire for themselves means of access to their Lord as to which of them should be nearest and they hope for his mercy and fear his torment. Fear the torment of your Lord is something to be afraid of. All right, so where is a nephew? The first time. All right, what is, what is, give it to me. A fala, they have neither the pahsantum, they have neither the power to remove the adversity from you. So we're what? Negating that they have any what? Any power, power to power. remove what? Adversity or to give you what you seek. You're seeking this from them, but they can't give you what you seek. Then Allah says what? Nor to change. Nor is. Okay, nor even to shift it from to another person. Okay, all that's negation. I sent to That's perfect. All right, where's the itbat? Where's the affirmation? Uh-huh. So he says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ يَبْتَغُونَ لَرَبِّهِمْ those people that they worship, they actually seek what? Nearness to who? Allah. Why do they seek nearness to Allah? Because He's the one who has the power, the ability, right? So we're affirming that He can do it, and they can't, and they can't do it. And this is important because what it does, it teaches how to think when we read the Quran. The Quran is not just what? Just words. It's something that when we're reading it, we're contemplating, and we're seeing, oh, look at the Tawheed. It just jumps out at you because what? Your mind is calibrated to think like that. You follow me? Yeah. So that's the first example. Let me give you the next one. The next one is Surat Az-Zukhruf. Surat Az-Zukhruf. Verses 26 and... Go by the meaning. And I'll give you a hint... There's two types of love mentioned, and love is an act of worship, mind you. There's two types of love mentioned in this ayah. One is the love which is what? Shirkiya. al mahabba shirkiya. The love which is monotheistic. I'm sorry, uh, polytheistic. Idolatrous. And then you have al mahabba tawhidiyya. The love which is what? Monotheistic. So pay attention to that. That'll help. They'll give you a hint. Okay? So who's going to answer from the sister? Nephi will it bat. Negation affirmation, this ayah. Who's got it? <laughs> if I look over there, my eyes catch it, they turn away like, you're not talking to me. Like, all right. So who's going to do it? Huh? No, you can answer too. I don't know. You answer. You yelled at me and told me that uh, I need to ask the questions in in English. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But if so, um, you can answer if you got it. Yeah, let's see what you got. Now, just remember, I gave you a hint too. Two types of love mentioned the ayah. One's the mahabba, shakia, the idolatrous love, and then the mahabba tohidia, the monotheistic love. Hmm. Okay, so where is the love for others and where is the love for Allah and which one is being confirmed and which one is being negated? So you're on the right track. You're on the right track. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this together, sisters. 
Let's find the love which is shirki or mahabba shirkiya, the love which is idolatrous, the love which is polytheistic. So where's that part at? So read it. Read it in English, yeah. Okay, so Allah is telling us they do this, and this is what? This is wrong. So this is what? This is your nephew. This is your negation. Then he says, but he says, he goes on to say they love them as they love Allah. Perfect. So we're done with the nephew. Now where's the ithbat? Where's the ithbat? Ah, ah, ah. Yeah. Those and those who believe, they what? They love Allah more than anything, more than anything else. So that's what? The ithbat. Okay? So Allah is telling us that this love, which is a type of the ibadah, is something that we should do what? We should affirm for him and what? Negate from all others. And we're talking about the divine love, not the love between two brothers, or the love between a mother and her son, or the love between a husband and wife. We're talking about what the love that's what a divine love. That's only the right of Allah. Mutaz. Okay, the last thing I'll give you the hadith, and then we'll be done with this chapter, and done for the night, inshallah ta'ala. So the hadith that he brings is from Sahih Muslim. And in this hadith, the Prophet said, مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَكَفَرَ بِمَا يُعْبَدْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ حَرُمَ مَالُهُ وَدَمُهُ وَهِسَابُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ So now, I want you to pay attention to this one, there could be more than one nafi, or more than one negation. Okay? He who professes that there is no God to be worshipped but Allah and made a denial of everything which the people worship besides Allah, his property and blood become inviolable as affairs rest with Allah. So when he said, Man qala la ilaha, that's what? A nafi. Wa kafara bima yu'bab min dunillah. And he denies everything which is worshipped besides Allah. It's also what? Nafi. Then he says, Il. Illallah. That's what the ithbat. That's kind of obvious because it has the shahada in it. La ilaha illallah. So these are the um, the nusus that he gave us, and they're exemplary. And he's telling us basically that this is how you, O Muwahid, can read the Quran and read the hadith and extract what? Extract the meaning of tawheed. And extract this. You're going to see this over and over again, O Muwahid, O Muhammadiyyist. You're going to see this with this nafi and ithbat. Nafi and ithbat. It trains you, what? To understand that. Whatever is entitled, that Allah is entitled to alone, you negate it from others and you give it to him and him alone. Okay? Then the shaykh, he concludes the chapter by saying, and he says, وَالشَّرْحُ هَذِي التَّرْجُمَةِ مَا بَعْدَهَا مِنْ الْبُوَابِ And he says the explanation of this chapter heading that we gave you, the meaning of a tawheed and the shahada, la ilaha illallah, he said it's going to be explained thoroughly by what? By what comes now in the following chapter. So now, everything that comes after this is going to clarify to us what it means to be a muwahid practically. He's going to talk about things that we have to avoid, things that we have to avoid that could do what? If we don't avoid them, they'll do what? Sometimes they'll totally violate, totally obliterate our tawheed. And some things which do what? Which weaken it, weaken our tawheed. He's going to give you the rest of the book is what? is about that. And that's what we're going to get into, inshallah ta'ala, next week when we resume. Any questions, Yahuani, Wahuati? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Going once? Going twice? No questions? Comment. Uh-huh, comment. Uh-huh, totally. Okay. Uh-huh. Hey. Ah, uh, so I should have said, where's the negation? Where's the affirmation? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, you guys did good. You guys did good. <laughs> Jimmy, you guys did good. I'm good luck. But no questions? I'll tell you. Right, so basically the foundation of a Tawheed, if you look at this Shahada that we have, that's the, the basically, it's the, the foundation of a Tawheed. It, said, it starts with a negation, La ilaha 